What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And today is no other, uh, Cheryl Conti. I'm going to formally introduce in a second. Cheryl, I always like to point out other episodes people should ch- check out on InspiredInsider.com. You know, I love hearing the stories that, not just the triumph, but the challenge stories. And one of my favorites of all time, favorite podcasts I've done over over 10 years was Chris Atageka. And Chris, uh, most people probably have never heard of Chris, but he is founder of two uh, nonprofits, two for-profits, and his story was like, they should make a movie out of it, Cheryl. Maybe you'll help make it. You'll uh, The impact seat will like make that happen somehow. Um, he grew up in Uganda at seven years old. He became an orphan because both his parents died of AIDS, uh, being the oldest of five children. He became the head of the household, and his brother died while he was taking him to the hospital, and so he started a nonprofit to rehab bikes to make them into bike ambulances so that people can take their loved ones to the hospital faster. But was interesting, he won a lottery um, in his village to go to the US. Um, speaks nine languages. He ended up going to the US to getting his PhD in college at Berkeley. Uh, just an amazing story. I I mean, it's so people check it out. Chris Atagek on inspiredinsider.com and Before uh, I introduce Cheryl, today's episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect their Dream 100 relationships. We do that by helping you run your podcast. And Cheryl, um, I know you're much of the same. The number one thing for me also is relationships in my life. And I always look at a way to give to my best relationships and profile the companies and people I admire by having them on my podcast. And so if you've thought about launching or starting a podcast or you just have questions about it, I think you should start one for sure. It's I've made amazing relationships, gone on vacations with people, have best friends from the people I've met by featuring them on my podcast. You can go to rise25.com, learn more, check out more. I've been doing it for over 10 years. Um, and I'm excited to introduce today's guest, Cheryl Conti, is co-founder and CEO of a digital marketing agency, Do Big Things. Before founding Do Big Things, she co-founded Vision Strategy and Attentively, and she released her book, Mechanical Bull, which details her history as a non-traditional startup founder. Attentively is a tech startup specializing in influencer marketing technology. It was acquired in 2018, making the first tech startup with a Black female founder on board in history to be acquired by a NASDAQ traded company. It's crazy, Cheryl, that that's actually the case. Um, And she's also part of leadership at Impact Seat, which I mentioned, which is focused on democratizing access to capital in America and around the world. Cheryl, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. You know, when I look at your background, um, Yale, uh, MBA at Georgetown, I'm thinking, how did she get started in this whole entrepreneur world? When you were in college or even before, what did you want to be when you grew up? You know, this is a, an interesting question that people often ask. And I, I do a lot of talking to younger people, um, which is a privilege. And one of the things I tell them is that my job didn't exist when I started college. I was part of a cohort that actually not only invented our careers, but helped invent the careers of others. And I think that's especially true of Generation Z and and younger people, that the careers for which they're preparing themselves don't really exist. And so, you know, my major was ethics, politics, and economics uh, at Yale. You know, a lot of a lot of different things. I mainly did it because you could basically take almost any class. And if you could justify it, you know, you could just add it to your major because I didn't I couldn't pick a major. Because again, the career I, you know, the career I ended up being in didn't exist. But while I was uh, in college, you know, I was a struggling minority scholarship, as many are, and I was required to have a campus job. So the highest paying jobs. Uh, on campus were in the kitchens, paid $17 an hour. So I'll take it. Of, I would take a lot that of money. Sure. 100%. Back, yeah. yeah. That was a lot of Plus, money. Plus, I probably, I would take 90s. it just for that they fed me. I would take it. We're yeah. still trying to get a minimum yeah. wage of $15. So they were unionized. Okay. Power of a union. 
but I hate washing dishes. And the idea of, of washing dishes for 20 to 30 hours a week, you know, just filled me with existential dread. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and also, you know, here I was already taking on loans, investing in myself. What would I learn about? I mean, how many times can you wash a dish and learn anything? So I looked for the next highest paying job on campus. And at the time, it was, you know, the equivalent of working at the help desk in the libraries, helping people with the computers there or the jam printer, what have you. So I want you to guess, Jeremy, how much that job paid. I'm going to guess uh, $12. Less, less, Ex exactly half, eight dollars and fifty cents. And you know, I look back and I see that as you know, such a critical crossroads in my life, where you know, I really chose, you know, to invest in myself in the hopes that it would create a better tomorrow for me and for others. So, you you leave college. What do you do? Uh, I spent a year in China uh, with the Yale and China program because I still didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up. So I figured that was a way to to buy some time. Um, and that was exciting. I, I learned a lot about myself, about others, and about China. <laughs> you know, the joke back then was, uh, you know, go to China for a week, write a book. You know, live in China for a month, write an article. Live in China for, you know, a year, you have nothing to say. <laughs> so there, it's too much to describe in a lot of ways, but I, I had a good time. What was your first, um, how'd you get started in entrepreneurship then? Yeah, you know, I, I kind of stumbled into it. You know, I, I had been raised, I think, as, as many people are, to, to find a job. I mean, in some ways, I probably remain a disappointment to my family in that I did not become a doctor. And I think for a lot of, uh, you know, bright minority kids, you know, there's, you know, people want you to have a safe yet, you know, well-paying job, right? So that's like basically doctor or lawyer. And if people know what it is, engineer. Uh, I did not do any of that. Uh, so uh, I hope they're still proud of me though. I'm but, sure. You know, my, yeah, but you know, the, you know, short of that, get a job, right? And try to rise through that job. And so, you know, I, I was just, you know, working away, you know, doing my best, you know, a time came, I was recruited out here to the Bay Area by, uh, you know, a very large multinational PR firm to launch their digital practice or relaunch their digital practice. And I wasn't really being treated well. I was working very hard. You know, I wasn't getting the support. I actually created a plan in which I was like, look, if you hire a couple of more people, you know, we do the following things, I can bring in a million dollars in revenue. They thought that was crazy. Uh, it turned out that I ended up being passed over uh, for a promotion that had been promised in my offer letter. And basically I said, look, you, you know, I'm delivering value. If you, you know, either you give me the promotion or I'm out. And they were like, oh, okay. So I left, they were sad. People got fired because I left ultimately. But uh, I, the power of a network, Jeremy, as you say, you know, relationships, I put out a tweet. I put out a tweet and said, hey, folks, I find myself available. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to work with me? And I actually got a lot of incoming, you know, uh, from that, you know, reputation matters. And one of those was the, you know, from the then boyfriend, now husband of the person who had become my business partner who said, hey, you know, you two should maybe link forces. Uh, you know, I think that would be, you know, a magical combination. And it was, you know, we in a lot of ways completed each other. And, uh, you know, we just started off as, as the two of us, $10,000 each in the bank. And I was like, look, we either have clients by the end of the month, or I need to find like an actual job at job because I'm not going hungry. Uh, and, you know, within a year, uh, we had 10 employees and we had made that million dollars of revenue. That's and amazing. In, in, yeah. And in something, you know, before it was a million dollars in revenue, you know, big companies, right? You know, Fortune 500 companies. You know, what I'm proud of is that, you know, we did that million dollars in revenue uh, working for good, working with nonprofits and foundations and causes. How did you get your first clients, customers, and then what was the offering at the time initially? Yeah, I think what set us apart, uh, and you have to remember this was circa 2008, uh, was that 
you know, my business partner and I were, were very loud in saying, look, we think social media is going to be a thing. <laughs> we think social media is going to be a thing and that, you know, just sticking with email is going to mean that you're going to miss out on a really big opportunity. We can help you. So if you want to get your social media game together and start to build that community and that, that audience, uh, you know, and, and mobilize, you know, for, for good, we can help you do that. And that got a lot of people's attention for sure, because no one in our space was really saying that out loud. Everyone was still, you know, very focused on email uh, as a, as a, uh, you know, a way to raise money or a way to, um, you know, get people to take action, you know, on various causes. Uh, you know, and our first client actually was someone that uh, my business partner had already been working with. She was kind of their ersatz CTO as a consultant. And we just, you know, built upon that relationship that was Moms Rising, uh, which then was, you know, very small. Now, of course, Moms Rising is, you know, enormous. I'm still really because good Because of the social media work you did with them early on. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yes. I mean, we, we revolutionized, you know, how they approached um, mm -hmm. their work. Um, you know, in part, we said, look, everyone at this organization needs to be a digital campaigner. And I still have to say that to people that, you know, you can't try to funnel this through just a couple of people. Anyone who is touching the public has to be someone who is digital savvy and comfortable community communicating with communities online. Sure. What did the, so you start off, okay, let us just help you with social media, get the word out. Um, wh how, what did the evolution of the services of the company look like? Because obviously you expanded from there. Well, we didn't know. And now, you know, if you read actual business books, they tell you to do this, but we just, you know, instinctively do this. You know, oftentimes when you offer one service, it turns out people need other things, you know, and that's, you know, partly how we, you know, ended up acquiring more staff was that people, you know, saw that we were good, you know, at, you know, creating social media presences, um, you know, engaging communities, you know, graphics, videos, all of that. Uh, and they said, you know, we built trust. They said, hey, you know, you're doing this. We could, you, could you help us with, you know, our, our website? You know, could you help us with, uh, you know, with this or that, with our, e you know, in some cases, our email list or with digital ads, digital ads were, you know, still very much a new thing. So, you know, it grew from there, you know, where people, you know, in building trust, uh, we were able to uh, ensure that people, you know, that those relationships grew. And how did it attentively come about? Yeah, similarly, you know, again, they, they write this in books, apparently, that I probably should have read, but was too busy running my business to read any business books. Uh, but, you know, it grew out of seeing a gap in the market, you know, in part in the, uh, you know, causes space, and, you know, and people say, oh, you know, can you really make money, you know, in causes and campaigns, you know, nonprofits consume like $800 billion in goods and services every year. So it's, it's actually a fairly significant segment, you know, of business. Uh, we, um, you know, we saw other, other people uh, building software, you know, and, and, you know, we're inspired by that. We're like, well, you know, so-and-so, you know, isn't smarter than us, you know, and we see something, you know, that's needed, you know, because we were in tech, you know, and in, you know, the cause of space, you know, again, we were at a, a crossroads, you know, and over in the tech side, and particularly on the corporate side, we could see that people were, you know, really getting into and making good use of influencer engagement, social listening, marketing automation, all of those were completely unknown concepts in the nonprofit space. And still are, you know, surprisingly, it might surprise people to know that, you know, influencer engagement is still you know, on the cutting edge, you know, in the nonprofit, even though in the, in corporate marketing, it is de rigueur, you know, it is just the way you make things happen. So, you know, attentively grew out of that, of seeing, you know, this need that our clients had, you know, and, and no product that could serve their needs. So attentively was, you know, it wasn't that original an idea. There were other uh, software products like it, but, you know, it was tailored you know, to the needs of the causes and campaign sector. And it, we priced it at a, at a point that we thought that they could afford. What are some of the challenges? That's a tough decision to make because you probably have a lot of staff, a lot of moving pieces. And then you're like, hey, let's, let's create a software company within our company. 
right? So talk about some of the challenges with that um, and kind of some of the decision-making they went around because, you know, from the outside, oh, great, they just grew this amazing new company, but the reality is probably in the beginning, it's you're dividing resources and, and time. Oh, absolutely. We very much bootstrapped for the first 18 months. And at first it was, again, just part of, you know, our just providing excellent service, you know, and that is unique and, and powerful for, for clients. Uh, but over time, you know, our, we got amazing feedback from our clients who were, you know, using the software, you know, we were using essentially uh, excess developer time. So, you know, if our developers, you know, weren't working on a website redesign or some kind of infrastructure build out, you know, it was a little quiet, you know, we would, we would use that time to, you know, continue to hone attentively. But over time, you know, after, you know, some time it was clear that, look, you know, if this is really going to be a thing, you know, this needs more capital and it needs a dedicated team. And so that's when we started to fundraise, which was very much not easy. You know, with, say the least. with um, were you thinking originally, were you going to use this internally to help manage all the clients or were you always going to have it be available so other companies can um, purchase a license to use the software? You know, we, it was very organic, I would say. Uh, no, I think we always intended, you know, that, and, you know, because we knew the agency space so well, I think we always knew that, you know, there would be, uh, you know, direct clients who would get it and, and be able to use it. But, you know, the, the agency sophistication, particularly on the technical side, is sometimes greater. And so 25% of our uh, clients were actually agencies who were then using the software again to create more power and impact uh, for their clients. Yeah, I could totally see how you create this just to make everyone's job easier internally because you're probably managing a lot of social media campaigns and helping your your clients, but there's a need out there. So there's maybe a push pull between someone. Should we even release this to the public? Because you have a competitive advantage too over everyone else. If you keep it internal, but then you all have another, you know, revenue source if you don't. But it sounds like you always were considering, well, we will release this to the public and have other people use it. I don't know that we were always thinking that, but, you know, it just, you know, and this is true, I think, of a lot of businesses. It took on a life of its own. You know, businesses, you know, whenever you get a group together of any kind, you know, it takes on its its own life, you know, its own destiny. And, you know, it was just clear that, you know, this was a thing that we had a tiger by the tail and that, you know, you know, we would, had to spin it out, you know, in order to give it, you know, the oxygen and energy it needed to, to really, you know, deliver. And it's, you know, a software is uh, probably a bit of a different animal. You had to raise money and then acquire. Talk about some of the lessons learned in the kind of the acquisition phase of Attentively. Well, before we get to acquisition, I mean, let's okay. talk about fundraising. Go okay? ahead, because, yeah. you know, you know, looking back, you know, we saw friends of ours in the space, you know, launching, you know, software companies, you know, for the causes sector. And like, oh, as I said, so-and-so is not smarter than us. If they can do it, we can do it it didn't occur to us that almost all of those people were white men. Okay. <laughs> Fortunately, I was blissfully unaware as was my partner that only three to 4% of venture capital of any kind goes to female startup founders. And of that, of that, the, the amount that goes to black female founders remains statistically zero. So, uh, you know, what I found was that you don't want to buy that lottery ticket pretty much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. obviously things are much better 10 years on, thank goodness, you know, and I hope that I've been a part of, you know, encouraging yeah. uh, more, you know, investment and a, and a broader, uh, broader access to capital. Um, but yeah, you know, what I found was that, you know, and I was the lead fundraiser for our first round, it was really difficult. You know, I had, I was used to at that point, people taking my calls or answering my emails. You know, I was a micro celebrity. I had a, an A-list blog, political blog, you know, that had been written up in the New York Times, mm -hmm. Agence France Press, like Al Jazeera, like you name it. Uh, you know, I'd been on CNN, you know, uh, MSNBC, et cetera. You know, people knew me, you know, I was, I was, you know, a, a little bit of a celebrity and I, we had built a multi-million dollar business already, 
right? So, you know, we thought that we were, you know, bringing pretty good credentials. There's, you know, there's the good table. street cred there. Yeah. You would think, you would think, Dr. Wise. And yet, you know, here I was, you know, crawling on my belly, trying to get people to talk to me. You know, people, you know, didn't respond. You know, when I did get someone, you know, into a meeting, you know, here's here's a, a story. Uh, so, you know, I'm sitting you know, in a, uh, you know, in a room, you know, doing a demo of our, you know, we had a product, it wasn't vaporware, like we had a product that had customers. Uh, I'm doing a, a demo in front of an investor who theoretically is like his job was to find people like me and invest in me. Like it was a fund that was dedicated to excluded entrepreneurs. Uh, by the time after I finished the demo, here's what he said. He said, you know, this is this is really interesting software, and I can see where you know uh, there's a market for it and, and a need for it. But I don't know if you are the person who can actually you know bring this to hmm. fruition. Said that to my face. So you know, I came up upon some you know really you know racist headwinds. And look, you know, in ra how racism you know and and or you know sexism, but let's talk specifically about racism. You know how it rears its head in the workplace today is is not necessarily someone calling you the n-word you know i mean most people most good people you know want to think of themselves as as anti-racist right as, as someone who is open to all you know it's more you know how pe people would say like oh well i'm just not comfortable you know i'm, I'm not com something makes me uncomfortable the thing that's making you uncomfortable is racism is bias okay and it, it and it's not necessarily intentional bias you know but i you know i I hope that, you know, you, dear listener, you know, really investigate that, you know, in yourself, like, you know, have you turned down, you know, hiring, you know, a black or brown person because, you know, or investing in a black and brown person, because you felt, quote, uncomfortable, you know, there's just something about them. What, you know, what was it really about them? And and can you maybe the next time overcome that? Would you have given someone who looks different more of the benefit of the doubt? Cheryl, you know, those moments in time um, are jarring and sometimes when they happen, it's hard to react. It's, to, you know, looking back, I'm, I'm curious, how did you react at the time? And then if you were to place yourself now back in that same position where he's like, I don't think you're the one to lead the company, how would you, you know, if someone's going to, who's listening to this may get that reaction at some point now or in the future. So I'm curious how you reacted then and then how would you instruct going back the Cheryl, the younger Cheryl to say, here's what maybe you should have said in the moment. That's a great question. You know, I don't know if I would have done anything different. I might mm -hmm. have, I might have, you know, actually, you know, asked some questions basically along those lines of like, why, why do you think I'm not the one, right? Mm -hmm. Why, why me? Like, who do you think? What are the attributes of the person you think would be able to take this amazing software that I have created that has customers? What what is that secret sauce you know that I don't have? Please enlighten me. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, instead, I mean, look, you know, as a a black woman in tech, I mean, I, I you know wasn't my first rodeo in terms of you know coming up against you know some kind of random and that's how it you know racism is it just it's like this you know distorting impact you know it's illogical it is irrational and so when you come up against it it's it is it's very dis it can be very disorienting you know and my response has always been haters to the left okay like if you don't get this if you don't get me if you're not down I, you know i'm not gonna waste time okay like and you know you're just here, like I, thank you so much i'll see you later yeah, thanks okay bye you know like yeah. you know and just you know cut it short and just got out you know what i will say is um you know, uh, I'm a senior advisor to um, an investment fund, you know, that focuses to several investment funds that, you know, focus on, uh, you know, female uh, tech, you know, startup founders. And, you know, one of them told me, look, Cheryl, you know, we have worked really, really hard to weed out as much bias as we could in our process. Like, you know, we, we took a very hard look at ourselves, you know, we brought in, you know, consultants, and we feel like we actually did a pretty good job because we really do want to, you know, have more black and brown founders you know, be successful, you know, with our, you know, with our investors. And what they found, the one thing that they had trouble weeding out 
was getting people to write checks. It, it took them on average uh, seven introductions to introduct to, to uh, seven introductions to investors to get a white female founder uh, funded. It took them on average 50, five zero introductions to get a, a an equivalent black female founder funded. And that sounded, when they said that, I was like, yeah, that's probably, you know, I would guess I, you know, reached out to at least 40 or 50 people and figured out at some point it was a numbers game. Mm -hmm. But I was just going to have to knock on a lot of doors, you know, and work pretty hard, you know, and instead of, you know, one or two or three people, you know, if I were white male, that I was going to have to literally do 10x in order to get those, you know, in order to get statistically less money. Talk about, and we could talk about, thanks for sharing those stories about the fundraising part. Um, I want to talk about the acquisition in a second, but let's talk about Impact Seat because this kind of relates to exactly what you're referring to. Talk about Impact Seat, what you do there, and how did you get involved with, with Impact Seat? Well, the Impact Seat, you know, I just feel so blessed, uh, you know, to, to be working with such an amazing crew. Uh, you know, the Impact Seat, uh, is one of the most prolific investors uh, in um, women-led uh, innovative tech startups. Um, we are invested in over 60 individual uh, companies in our portfolio, including many of them are um, women of color founders who are amazing, all of, the, all of them are amazing, but we also are invested in 15 different funds uh, and through those funds have invested in dozens more, many, many more, um, you know, companies. Uh, so, you know, and our goal is uh, to ensure that, uh, you know, there is more democratized access to capital, not because we're nice people. I mean, we are, I like to think I'm nice, you know, <laughs> and, you know, in Silicon Valley where I live, you know, there's still very much this, you know, notion of diversity, equity, and inclusion as like a moral imperative, right? Like if you're a good person who's living right, you know, you're actually, you know, at least trying, you know, to, to move in that direction. Nah, Jeremy, it's about making money. Diverse companies win and we want to win. Every study shows that diverse companies are more innovative, they are more productive, and they are more profitable. If you want ROI, you need the EI. Monoculture firms are just less successful in part because, you know, they just don't have the best ideas percolating. You know, they don't have that creative collaboration and friction happening. So, you know, it's really exciting, you know, to, you know, be part of a, of a team that is working hard to make sure that, you know, the best, uh, you know, the best products, you know, the most amazing apps, you know, the coolest services, you know, get, you know, the, the capital they need, no matter who is the founder, you know, to be successful and to change the world. Talk about some of the team at Impact Seat and, you know, some of the, uh, I guess, uh, learnings from them. Oh, gosh. Well, you know, we have, uh, you know, a, a, a number of people. We're actually a pretty small crew, but, you know, Barbara Clark, uh, our founder, is incredible. She is a polyglot. So she too speaks nine languages. Uh, mm -hmm. I wish I, I, I wish I could. I'm barely literate in English. God, God, no, I'm alone, me. any other languages. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Barbara Clark is amazing. She has a, a strong finance background and has been very successful. You know, in a world where it's challenging. You know, for for women. I mean, tech can be challenging. Uh, for women, as as folks know, finance in many ways has an even tougher reputation. And, you know, so she is, you know, a person who's seen it all, you know, and, and wants to, you know, reach a hand down, you know, to help others, you know, coming up and, you know, to use her capital, you know, again, to solve the world's biggest problems, you know, and so we, you know, when we invest, we're really looking for, you know, does this solve is this, does this startup solve a really big problem in an innovative way that's going to move humanity forward in some way. And then our, uh, my co-founder, uh, co-founder, uh, my colleague, Terrence Craig, uh, is an engineer by training. Uh, he too is, you know, a, a rare uh, black tech founder, a startup founder who has had a successful exit. 
um, and had it earlier, you know, than most. And uh, he has written uh, a book uh, very successfully with O'Reilly Media. So, you know, it's just, you know, amazing, you know, an amazing team. And, you know, we balance each other out. You know, we, we each bring something very different to the table, you know, and, and together that creates a lot of magic. What, um, Sean, when you look at some of the portfolio companies at Impact Seat, which one, um, what are a few that stick out as, you know, interesting that people should check out? I was looking on your page and I see like Lesson B, Soapbox Labs, Board on Track. What are some of the ones that stick out to you as like, you know, I would never thought of that or attacking a problem in a unique way. Well, we, we actually have a, you know, it's public now, you know, one of our companies, Alidia, um, has created a, a medical device uh, that um, stops postpartum bleeding. And it's the kind of device that you can have in a fancy hospital in New York City, you know, or in a field hospital in Rwanda. Hmm. And, you know, postpartum bleeding, as, as you can imagine, is a big problem, you know, for, uh, you know, new mothers. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, again, you know, surprisingly, you know, only you know, 4% of medical research dollars and uh, similar, you know, venture capital dollars go into uh, women's health and solutions for women's health, which is stupid because women are more than 50% of the people. Right. So there's, you know, again, like, you know, separating out the moral, you know, question about that, you know, it's also, you know, a greatly missed financial opportunity to sell. And look, women buy 85 percent of everything. OK, look it up. So, you know, it just doesn't make any sense to not fund female founders. You know, it just doesn't make any sense to not have you know, a woman, you know, on your team who is senior and can tell you what women were, are going to buy. I mean, it's just eight 18th century old timey thinking that just doesn't belong, you know, in a modern world if you actually want to make money. Okay. Like if, if all you want to do is make money, I promise you that investing in excluded entrepreneurs is going to yield some surprising benefits for you. So, yeah. you know, that, that's one that, you know, has been a big success. It is, uh, it's been acquired, you know, by, um, you know, really big company, you know, and, and, you know, we're really proud, you know, to, uh, you know, help, help them early on. We tend to do early stage uh, and seed uh, funding. I remember um, the first time we left the hospital with our first child and they hand you like a big, there was like, here, the nurse was like, you can even need these. And there was a big bag. It was like, this long, thick pad. I'm like, what is this for? They're like, just give it to your wife. She's going to need it. You know? So I totally, I totally not experienced it, nor would I ever want to experience. Thank God for women actually having children. Cause I think if the male populated the earth, there would be like not many people on this earth. <laughs> we're not tough enough for that, but um, well, people have different bodies and look, you yeah. know, that's for normal. Yeah, I mean, I've been pregnant and, you know, yeah. managed to successfully eject, you know, that human. I mean, you know, that's for just like normal bleeding. You know, when you're bleeding out, right. like it's a bad scene, right, yeah. for everybody. And, you know, the fact that this device now exists, you know, and is going to, you know, now, you know, has a big company behind it who can manufacture it en masse okay. is, you know, exactly the kind of revolutionary uh, innovation that, that we get excited about being a part of and fostering. Yeah, no, totally. Thanks for sharing that. And I encourage anyone to go to impactseat.com and check out what they're doing there. Um, so now it comes to acquisition. So you have to make, you know, 50 calls for every one of someone else. Uh, so you get that going. Um, what was the acquisition process like? Oh boy. Well, the acquisition process was interesting. Uh, you know, we were at a stage and I think a lot of companies, you know, reach the stage where they say, you know, we could raise another round or we could start to look to exit. You know, it's going to take about the same amount of energy and time. You know, it's usually about, you know, conventionalism six to 12 months. So we said, you know, looking at all of the global factors, you know, we said, you know, this might be a good time to start to exit, you know, uh, companies, uh, you know, social media companies were really starting to, 
tighten down their APIs and, you know, their privacy permissions, which, you know, and keeping up with that was getting increasingly challenging. You know, we, we sense that this needed, you know, the software really needed to be within a CRM where it would have, you know, the access to permissions, um, you know, that were starting to close down. I mean, that was definitely a part of it. So we started the process of interviewing, uh, you know, M&A uh, bankers. And, you know, it was just such an interesting process, you know, again, you know, it's not necessarily if, if venture capital is not very diverse, <laughs> uh, you can imagine that, you know, the M&A field is even less diverse. Uh, but we were, you know, very keen, you know, not only to find a, you know, a, you know, a talented person, but we knew, you know, that we were very visible, even though, you know, we were not huge, you know, because of who we were, we were very visible in the space. And we wanted to be able to, you know, tell, you know, a good story, you know, about, you know, what we had achieved. And so, you know, we talked to a, a, you know, a wide variety. And at this point, I was like eight months pregnant, okay, when we were doing these interviews. So that was also, in some ways, a big test. I mean, we had one guy, you know, I, I looked at, you know, it had been, this is, was a, um, a person who had been recommended by one of our, uh, one of our investors, you know, we talked to him, you know, and I just asked him straight up, I was like, look, sir, you know, I'm looking at your website. And, uh, you know, you have zero women and uh, zero people of color working for you. You have one Asian American male on your board. What makes you think that you can represent someone like us? And have you ever represented someone like us? Uh, and he was silent and then he started laughing. And it was a weird laugh, Jeremy. Uh, and, you know, he just answered the, the question, basically was like, oh, I never actually thought about it. Never thought about it. So he was disqualified. He disqualified himself. Okay. Like, it was just like, That's I, a bad was, answer. It was a bad answer. It was like a re like, like a, like an almost cartoonishly inappropriate response to, you know, can you represent someone like me in these rooms? Because that's the thing, like, and, and, you know, a mergers and acquisition banker, you know, is going to have conversations about you representing you in rooms you're not in. So they've got to really under get you, they've got to vibe with you, you know, you've got to be at least somewhat compatible, right? So that they can, you know, really, you know, defend your defend your honor, you know, in, in these rooms and you know, use, you know, voice your your opinion. So uh, you know, eventually we found someone, I actually saw her. Uh, Adventure Atlanta, she was on a panel and she was so smart, Trisha Salonero of Woodside Capital. Um, so we teamed up with her um, and she was great. Uh, you know, such a pro, um, you know, got us through the process. You know, I will say that, you know, talking to companies, even though the M&A process was very weird um, and at times awkward, uh, you know, we didn't really get that kind of, uh, we didn't have that issue with the companies that we talked to. You know, every all of the companies that we talked to actually treated us very respectfully, um, and uh, you know, it turns out again, relationships are so important. You know, it turns out that uh, one of we were uh, a marketing partner of Blackbaud, you know, and they had been watching us for a long time, and they they I wouldn't say that they were that it was the strongest you know strategic partner that we had. You know, it was one of them. Um, you know, but what they noticed was that they were their roadmap you know, had a, a sort of an attentively sized hole in it, you know, and that's what most companies are looking to do, right? You know, they're looking to, you know, do we need to build this? Is it cheaper to build it or, you know, easier to buy it, right? And, you know, it's hard for big companies to innovate, not because they don't have super smart people working there, you know, just the, all of the layers of approval and just everything is just so, so slow. Um, so that's why startups, you know, get acquired. So, yeah, I love what, that. Yeah, well, yeah, what they noticed was that, you know, 30% of our client base were BlackBaud customers as well. You know, so there was just a clear market sign there that look also there that look, you know, this is this seems to be something that our, our customers want. And, you know, they had a much more robust, you know, sales engine than we do is like 40,000, you know, clients. So, you know, it just ended up being, you know, a happy marriage. And, and that's something that I, I do counsel startups a lot about, you know, have your exit strategy in mind before, before you launch your startup, 
we knew we we were fairly confident even as we were launching attentively that we would ultimately get acquired and that actually very much informed you know how we went about our strategic partnerships what apis we integrated with you know the relationships we built and it, it ended up and it's true for i would probably say most startups that you know it's through an existing relationship with a larger partner that you'll end up getting acquired Cheryl, why do you think Blackbaud won out when you say it wasn't the strongest strategic partnership? Obviously, it was a, still a strong strategic partnership, but why do you think that company won out? And I love what you said, by the way, of they could build it or buy it. And that, like, I uh, remember when I had the, the founding engineer at Mobileye on, and he said the exact same thing when they were, um, Intel was looking at acquiring their technology. And um, they ended up paying $15.2 billion. And they figured that to be cheaper than it would to build it themselves and to go to market. Because like you said, you already had traction, you had customers. There is a lot that goes in. It's not just the software itself, but it's the the brand and the name and everything else. So why did Blackbud win out? Oh, well, and by strongest, I mean, you know, we weren't necessarily as often in contact. Mm. Right. With with that team, you know, like we liked them and they liked us. But, you know, there were other, uh, you know, companies and brands with which, you know, we were just, you know, more frequently, you know, collaborating or, or talking. Uh, you know, I think they went out, you know, they they really you know, we had complementary values, you know, and that was really important to us. And I'm really proud that we were an impact startup that got acquired by an impact corporation. You know, BlackBot is one of the leading purveyors of nonprofit software in the world. Um, and so that was really meaningful to us, you know, to make sure that, you know, attentively in our team, you know, it's not just about the product. Product is important. You know, I think we wanted to make sure that our team, you know, was going into an environment, you know, where they would be um, valued, you know, and respected and, and understood, you know, for what they would bring to the table. You know, first of all, Cheryl, I want to thank you. And I have one last question um, before I ask it. Um, where should we point people online to check out all the stuff that you're doing, all the companies that you're working on? Where are the, all the places we should point people towards? Obviously, you mentioned impactseat.com. Where else? Where else should we point? Yeah, people? absolutely. Impactseat.com. Check it out. You know, especially if you are uh, a VC, you know, we love to do syndicate. Uh, co-investing. So, you know, come check us out. We have amazing deal flow. You can imagine we have the coolest companies you can imagine. So come on down. Uh, you know, I'm also the chair and founder of Do Big Things. Uh, Do Big Things is a digital agency, one of the leading uh, in the country that works with uh, nonprofits, foundations, uh, corporations with mission-driven initiatives and political campaigns to provide the new narrative and new tech the new era that we live in today. So we're really proud of that team, you know, full services from, you know, campaign design uh, to implementation, uh, including digital ads, you know, and we have a tech team in-house, which is very rare. Uh, so you can check uh, that out um, at uh, www.dobigthings.today. Love it. And there's also, I think we mentioned that I have an Amazon best-selling book called Mechanical Bull, How You Can Achieve Startup Success. I'll tell you, Jeremy, you know, I wrote that book because after the acquisition of Attentively, you know, a friend of mine sat me down and said, look, Cheryl, more people have been to the moon than have done what you have done. Like literally, like 17 people have been to the moon. Only one person has done, has been you. And you have an obligation to help others come behind you. So, you know, this is, you know, I wrote the book I wish I'd had, and it's not just my voice, you know, it's the voice of a lot of uh, founders, uh, you know, of all different backgrounds, uh, a lot of investors, you know, similarly of all different backgrounds. So it's got a lot of dumb jokes in there. So look for that. Uh, but I like it's jokes. Also, yeah, it's, but it's also, uh, I used to say in the before times, it was a good airplane book. People are starting to get on planes. So, you know, uh, grab it for the airplane, but it's also got a lot of very practical information. If you're, 
you know, just starting out and thinking, oh, you know, what would it be like to, to start a business? You know, can I do this and how do I do that? Or if you're midway, you know, what do I need to do to manage my burn, to gain traction and to maybe have a successful exit? I love it. Yeah. And then you have an audio version of it? Working on the audio Okay, version. I thought so. Yes. Working. Yes. People, yeah. uh, you know, especially now that, you know, I'm uh, working with the impact seat, definitely have heard a lot of feedback that people want the audio version. So uh, check me out in the fall. Yeah. We, so we by the time this the goes fall. live, maybe it's not quite out yet, but check it out on Amazon, check it out on Audible when it, go, it comes out or pre-order it, whatever it is, I'll be ordering it for sure. Because I listen to everything on audio. Um, last question is about mentors. I want one, you know, wonder a few of your mentors throughout your career and maybe a couple of lessons that you learn from them. Oh boy. You know, there are, you know, great mentors, you know, who, you know, encourage, you know, how, who have encouraged me, like, you know, amazing bosses, you know, who, you know, help me you know, to learn and to grow. And I'm, I'm really grateful, you know, to them, you know, but I actually learned a lot from like the terrible bosses that I had, you know, where it's like, oh, this person sucks. And it, this is like not a great way to motivate or lead a team. You know, I want to be the opposite of this. Like if I were in charge, you know, how would I be doing that? You know, and I would say, you know, in every company that I've started, I've, I've always tried to create a, a, you know, an atmosphere of collegiality, you know, we're, we're supporting each other, you know, we, uh, you know, are uh, bringing excellence, you know, to our, our clients, um, you know, and we are every day. You know, I um, want to ask one last question. I, I always say last question, but that makes me think of something else. But the you know, it makes me think when you are look researching the firms um, to represent you, or even when you're getting investment and you're seeing just a page of all white males, right? And, and let's say instead of that person saying you're not the person to lead this company, Cheryl, if if that person said, "How can we do better? What should we do as a starting place?" To you know, like you said, when you want ROI, you need DEI. What advice do you have for a company that does want to start that path and they're, you know, they're looking around the room and they're seeing all the same type of people? Right. No, that's a really great question. And, you know, after the George Floyd, um, you know, protests, uh, you know, I, you'd be surprised how many, you know, white male, you know, colleagues and friends that I've known, you know, some that I knew well and some that I didn't know well you know, who asked me that same question, like, hey, I get it that like, maybe, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not living right, Cheryl, you know, what can I do, you know, to, to course correct here. And, uh, you know, what I say is, you know, invest in someone who doesn't look like you, like, like, make it a priority to, you know, find people that don't look like you. And, you know, I know that's daunting, you know, for a lot of people. I read a study once that, you know, something like 75% of white people actually don't know a person of color personally, which is insane. Like, I don't even know how that works. Like those people don't live in cities. I would probably not like, in the city. Like, yeah, exactly. like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, how does that work? But, you know, it is a network issue in part, you know, part of how these monocultures you know, have been involved is because, you know, people just hire people that they know or that someone recommends and, you know, those people look kind of the same. Uh, so, you know, you're going to have to do things a different way, right? The way that you built your current team is not going to work, right? You, you have to assume that you're going to have to do things a little differently and talk to some different people, you know, reach out. Don't, don't be afraid. I think, you know, a lot of white people, you know, they're, they're so worried about making a mistake, you know, that they don't reach out, they don't ask, you know, they don't do things differently, you know, reach out, you know, even if you have one person of color in your network, you know, or, you know, they're not even in your network, but you've heard of them. They would love to hear from you. And they would, you know, love to say, you know, ask them, yeah, who do you know? You know, or, you know, can you, you know, pass this around? Can you share this job announcement on your LinkedIn? you know, chances are you're going to start to get some really interesting candidates, you know, and again, look, you know, having people, you know, any, uh, you know, financial advisor, 
is going to tell you to diversify your portfolio, right? That just makes sense. Similarly, any investor is going to look for a team that is diverse, at least in specialties, right? You've always got to have your visionary, your tech lead, your product and marketing person, right? You know, you're, if you're building something, your manufacturing lead, right? You can't have all of the same people. If everyone is an engineer, that company is probably not going to be very successful. Similarly, you know, if you have a monoculture, you are really missing out. Look, America is diversifying. Okay, whether you like it or not, no matter how you feel about that, okay, America is going to look different over the next 20 years, very different. And if you want to take advantage of that phenomenon, you know, and, you know, make some money, you know, that requires, you know, making sure you've got the perspectives and understand, you know, these communities so that you can, you know, create, you know, culturally appropriate, uh, you know, messaging. Cheryl, I want to be the first one to thank you. Thank you for sharing your stories. Thank you for what you are doing for everyone. Everyone check out the impact seat, do big things, mechanical bull, and so much more. Cheryl, thanks again. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. Right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.